action connoisseurs. Once again, it is I, your Duke of Dope Discourse, Robert Meyer Burnett, and I invite you to watch and listen to the Designing Hollywood Podcast, brought to you by Martika Abera and the great, legendary Hollywood costume designer, Marilyn Vance. I am afforded the wonderful opportunity of co-hosting the show. If you are interested in the magic of Hollywood, the design of Hollywood, the clothes of Hollywood, watch the Designing Hollywood podcast, available wherever you get your podcasts from, or find the video version on YouTube. That's right, the Designing Hollywood podcast. Why would you ever want to miss it, especially if you love the movies? Tango Shalom is now available on, on all, all VOD, VOD major platforms. platforms. <laughs> I think we missed that. Up. Video on demand, or as they say in the trade, VOD. VOD. Uh, Tango, Tango Shalom, Shalom is now, is now available, available on, on all, all VOD platforms. platforms, which means video on demand. Look how you know. You must be a high school graduate. I'm a college graduate. Really? Yes. I got an honorary degree from Hofstra. My, did you get an honorary degree? No, I got a degree. <laughs> oh, well, I got an honorary. You know, I'm in the Jewish Museum. What for? What do you mean? As a famous Jew in you the are? Bronx. I'm in the famous... I have a, uh, I'm in the Prospect Park in the, in the stones. How big is the stone? <laughs> Observations with Robert Meyer Burnett. Well, greetings, Imagination Connoisseurs. Once again, it is I, your Duke of Dope Discourse, your master of fun and wonder, your viceroy of verisimilitude, your evangelist of the imagination, and yet still undefined, your existential Mr. Rogers. That's right, Robert Meyer Burnett. And I am back, Robcasting it. You, <clears throat> you, you Imagination Connoisseurs, you members of this, the Post Geek Singularity community, this is Rob Observations, episode number 700. And 60. Wow, that's amazing. Only 40 episodes to our 800th episode. Better step up the pace, huh? Maybe I can make it there before Christmas. Christmas is coming, of course. But you know what I already got here? Marvel's Eternals. And um, it's been a very interesting, interesting uh, examination. Not what, do, what do I want to call it? It's been, an in, it's been interesting to watch the Eternals... Um, open and all of the varying degrees of um, love and affection or not that the film has received. I went and saw it for the second time in IMAX yesterday at the Chinese theater. I took my 19 year old nephew, Logan, my sister's son, oldest son, who was visiting down here. And he and I have actually in our entire lives, never gone anywhere together. He had his friend down. I went and picked him up. And uh, took him to the Chinese theater. He'd never seen, he'd never been inside the Chinese theater before. He'd been to L.A., but he'd never been in there. And he thoroughly enjoyed it. He's a Marvel fan, a Star Wars fan, grew up a, a genre film fan. And he didn't have any any expectations necessarily other than it was Marvel. And he liked Marvel. And he really enjoyed it because he liked all of the historical aspects to the film. He really obviously didn't know much about the Eternals. But thoroughly enjoyed it. Both him and his friend did. And it was, um, I had my favorite seats right there, dead center row, M or N. Those are my favorite seats in the um, in the Chinese. And we had a, a great time watching. It was my second time seeing it. And as everyone knows, I'm a fan of the movie. Well, this morning when I got up, one of the first things that I did this morning was uh, I watched Gary Beekler, a.k.a. Nerdrotic, who I watch a lot. I like Gary's channel. I like the Nerdrotic channel. I watched Gary Beekler's review of Eternals, and to say he didn't enjoy it is putting it mildly. I mean, he tore the film up one side and down the other. Now, here's something uh, that you all might find interesting. For the most part, I didn't disagree with anything that Gary was saying, that Nerdrotic was saying. He made a lot of very salient points, and I thought, for the most part, 
from his point of view, he was essentially correct in what he was saying. Now, it's interesting because I've watched and read a lot of different takes on the Eternals. Why is there always a little tiny bug flying around here? Um, and, you know, for me, I don't know um, how all of you feel, but the whole point of this channel is to is to foster the communication, the dialogue between people from opposing points of view or various walks of life. So I watch a lot of uh, contrary uh, videos and read a lot of contrarian articles to things I necessarily believe in. Because I think that's the only way that you really come to understand your own beliefs because you need to you need to be able to explain what you believe to somebody that might not agree with what you're saying, but you need to learn how to do it in a civil way. And I find, obviously, Gary Beekler is is somebody who uh, I admire. He was a comic book store owner for over a decade. He knows his stuff. So if he doesn't like something, he usually has a pretty good reason for not liking it. And so, you know, I always watch his channel when a new movie comes out or something that he reviews, just like I watch... Um, I'll watch, you know who reviews a lot of Marvel and Star Wars and science fiction movies is Ben Shapiro. And well, I, I talked once about Ben Shapiro releasing a film, his company, uh, The Daily Wire, you know, they they got into film distribution. A lot of people are like, Rob, Ben Shapiro. Well, yeah, Ben Shapiro is a very highly educated guy. He and I are diametrically opposed, usually, politically. But there are some things I can find that we have common ground on. But I do watch his genre film reviews. I watch lots of people's reviews of movies that run the gamut. Because otherwise, how are you going to learn, you know? Now, the funny thing about Gary's review, it did make me think. Like, for instance, I'll give you an example. And if you haven't figured it out yet, this is going to be a very spoiler-filled show. So if you haven't seen Eternals and you don't want to be spoiled, I would tune out now and I'll I guess I'll raise my hand when we get to the letters portion or something. But one of the things that that Gary objected to was the portrayal of Icarus in the film, played by Richard Madden. Obviously Icarus is the leader of the Eternals and, you know, as Gary is wont to do, he was talking about the fact that he's he's the white guy who gets turned into the villain when usually as far as Kirby portrayed him in the comics, he was a hero. Now He's not wrong. <laughs> I mean, he's 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 not wrong. Now, however, I was coming at it from a different viewpoint. What I really liked about the movie, for instance, is Icarus is a fundamentalist. Not a crazy fundamentalist, but Arisham, the celestial that created him, literally Icarus's creator. Icarus was created to to facilitate, he, he, he was created because of a certain task. And that task, of course, was to facilitate the birth of a new celestial. That's what the Eternals do, is, is they, they go to a planet, they make sure that the dominant species of the planet grows and evolves and, and, and develops a certain bioenergy, a biomass, to the point where a celestial can be born in the planet that it's gestating in and use that energy to feed off of to join the universe. And once a celestial is here, it'll be responsible for many other civilizations rising up. So one civilization is sacrificed to give birth to an eternal, and that eternal in turn will um, cause many other civilizations to be born. So you're sacrificing one civilization for many. The needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few or the one. And in the course of the movie, the Eternals come to know and respect and love humanity because they're very different than other life forms, presumably. And so they're, they're in a moral quandary. When, when humanity returned back, when the Avengers brought back all of humanity from Thanos' snap, that jolt of energy started the emergence Tiamat, the, the celestial that is is sleeping, that is going to be born of Earth, starts to stir and it's going to rise up. Now, one of the things that I found so compelling about the Eternals is that Icarus then is faced with a choice. 
he he believes in his creator. He understands, and by the way, so does Kingo. So does uh, Camille Nagiani's character. They're kind of on the same page, and Sprite because she's in love with Icarus. So there's a rift in the Eternals because they're they're there to fulfill their destiny, what they're supposed to be doing. And the idea of saving mankind, saving humanity, is is basically wrong. That's the Eternals going against their programming. So in the film, while on one side you could look at the fact that Icarus is a villain, I look at it as somebody who is trying to um, fulfill the destiny that he was made for. Now, we obviously want to see mankind endure, but from Icarus's perspective, his job is to facilitate the birth of this eternal celestial who is going to create many, many more life forms and probably help the universe as opposed to not helping the universe. Um, of course, the celestials have been lying to the Eternals as well. The celestials have, have been uh, selling the Eternals a bill of goods that isn't true. And uh, then they wipe their memories, so they forget what they've learned, and they have to start all over again. So you could then say that, okay, Icarus was misled um, by forces that are beyond his control, so we forgive him. But the thing is, from Icarus's perspective, he is doing the thing that he is supposed to be doing. So in my mind, when I was watching this film, I found that conflict, when that central conflict is set up by the halfway point in the movie... I was fascinated. I, I was like, this is really, I, I, I really found this whole thing to be very compelling. Now, from Gary's perspective, he was looking at it as a bastardization of Kirby's original incarnation or original conception for Icarus. And then also that it could be the reading of the movie is that, well, Icarus is the white cis male that is doing bad. And the thing is, he ain't wrong. There's definitely a reading of the movie that would say, yep. Uh, and it's a little, uh, they could have made Kingo the, the the person that's like Icarus, but Icarus is the most powerful one, so by making him the person they have to go against, it makes the Eternals, they have to have a surmountable or an insurmountable uh, adversary to fight. And it either way you want to look at it, Gary's not wrong, and I don't think I'm wrong either. I put aside the the identity politics and political issues because I didn't think it dominated. I mean, that's definitely something you could say is there, but it isn't overtly there because one of the things I thought was interesting about the Eternals is that presumably the way I read it is that the Eternals are examples of the different kinds of versions of life, dominant life forms. So the reason they're so diverse, the Eternals are diverse, is because there's already a diverse Eth there's already diverse ethnicities on earth that previous that already exist there so by by and this is again my own mind it's not in the film but this is how i read it that the reason there's these different eternals is because they look like people from all across the world which makes sense so you could have whatever eternal looks most like the people that you want that eternal to work amongst or whatever they're there for that reason so if they went to a planet where humanoids look totally different or maybe there was there were the dominant species had four legs and four arms. The Eternals would be designed to look the way they're supposed to look to blend in with the dominant species. Now, this isn't dealt with at all, but in my mind, that's kind of how I saw it. So, you know, when you're watching, when people are watching movies, they have different points of view. They come at movies from different perspectives. Now, do I think that the Eternals is the same? Is it as enjoyable to me? as say infinity war do i think do i find the entertainment value um the same as infinity war which i find monumentally entertaining well the answer to that is no the eternals is a different kind of movie and to me one of the things i really enjoyed about the eternals is that our eternals as i was watching it i just found myself thinking about what was going on rolling it all around in my head going wow this is really interesting, and I've talked about it up before, the cosmology of it all, Arashem, and the rest of the uh, celestials, and how does this all work, and how, how did the Eternals bring humanity along, and the fact that really the Eternals, um, their job is to make sure that humanity uh, moves along, and they can't, they're not supposed to interfere, but they're definitely pushing. It's not like there's no, it's, there's no prime directive with the Eternals. Nope, we can't interfere. They can't interfere 
in internecine battles that humanity is having well amongst itself. So they can't do that. They can't because those are the things that cause evolution. And now the Eternals, you know, they're obviously throwing out technology and, and all that, which I didn't mind. You know, it didn't, although I've talked about it before, the one thing that Gene Roddenberry used to say about the idea of ancient astronauts is that, no, ancient astronauts didn't build the pyramids. Human beings built the pyramids because human beings are awesome. Uh, well, anyway, as I was watching the, the, the film and seeing it a second time, there were little bits that I caught that I didn't quite understand like one of them and i don't know why this passed me by but when when the unimind when the when the eternals all at the end uh when circe calls upon them and calls upon the unimind uh that fastos helps create the energy the reason that circe is able to stop the emergence of tiamat from the earth is because it's tiamat's energy that they're feeding off of they're now connected to that celestial and that connection has never been used against a, a celestial before but circe uses it against tiamat to to turn him to stone freeze him turn him into marble whatever the hell he is at the end and i like that but what what i thought was really interesting is that at the end you have this this planet-sized being that was emerging from the cocoon of the earth and it's fro you know it's frozen at the indian ocean with this giant head and arms and i mean <laughs> the armies of the, the the navies of the world archaeologists everybody will be like what the hell's going on who knows if if the eternals will make sure that there's an answer that's given but what again what that does to humanity i don't know and then they see obviously the same kind of being in the skies above the earth and once humanity has seen that, what, what happened? So I found The Eternals to be fascinating. I thought it was a fascinating movie. I liked it even more the second time. I like all the actors and the roles, and I could have watched it. I could have been six or ten hours long, and they could have delved into all this stuff a lot more than they did, and I would have loved it. Now, there's a lot of people that I respect in the industry that um, one particular, um, um, a friend of mine, Adrian, he, he contacted me. He's a movie producer, and he's got a lot of projects percolating right now. He's made some things that you've probably all seen. And, you know, he hated this movie, just like he hates Star Trek The Motion Picture. And I, I admit, the things that he was saying, um, not wrong. But uh, I find this movie to be deeply polarizing depending on how you're watching it and what you expect to get out of it. I understand that the the thrills and the characterization and the things that we've been getting from Marvel movies might not be um, uh, it, it, Eternals is not always that, but I know just as many people that felt kind of the way that I did that they found it very thought provoking and interesting, and um, I have not changed my mind this the, the second time I saw it. Now, there's a couple of articles I wanted to read. Uh, first of all, beginning with the old stalwart Forbes and, of course, Scott Mendelson, who um, he loves to go after the Marvel Universe. But he wrote an article that was published uh, on November 4th. Uh, Will Eternals suffer the same fate as Snow White and Sicario, he writes. The biggest tidbit in the Toronto Sun's Eternals article from Sunday concerns Marvel Studios producer Nate Moore declaring that an Eternals sequel is, quote, not something that is a must-have. That could just be playing preemptive defense in the case of the film, which has earned the worst reviews of any previous MCU movies. At the time of the writing of this article, it was 52% rotten with a 5.7 to 10 average critic score on Rotten Tomatoes. Fails to perform to conventional MCU standards at the global box office, both in terms of global box office and post-debut word of mouth. More amusing are the bits in the post arguing that Kit Harrington's Dane Whitman, the human boyfriend of Gemma Chan, celestially pow celestial powered and immortal Cersei, may have a big future with the MCU. Slight spoiler, but in this article too, Whitman's eventual future as the Black Knight positions him for a future MCU adventure. Could the most diverse, inclusive MCU movie yet be a backdoor pilot for a white man's solo spinoff flick? First of all, fuck all y'all for talking this way, Scott. The fact is the Black Knight exists in, and, and if you look where he comes from, he's a knight from, you know, Arthurian mythos and all of that. And it's like, he's supposed to be white, I mean, that's the conception of the character, just like the hobbits of Middle-earth. It's it's kind of where he came from. It's literally in his DNA. So just because he's a white man or a white character, he is the Black Knight, comes from medieval England or or the British Isles, and it's I, I'm just so tired of all this, this ridiculous rhetoric. History is history. 
People were people. And this idea that the Black Knight, which, by the way, he's been an Avenger. Dane Whitman will be an Avenger. And he also has ties, if you really want to get into it, the Ebony Blade, which is mentioned in the same breath by Sprite uh, 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 when she also finds out from Fina that... Um, or talks about how the Ebony Blade and Excalibur are linked. The Ebony Blade has ties to symbiotes. I mean, there's so much interesting stuff going on. It ties to Venom, the character of Dane Whitman in The Black Knight, and the fact that uh, Mahershala Ali, is that's his voice, man. It's Blade's voice at the end. Why? I won't get into it. You can delve into the the Marvel Universe if you want. If you want to find out why would Blaine, why would Blade and Dane Whitman... Um, why would Blade be in the same room with him? Well, there's a lot of reasons, and they all come from the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Anyway, that's no shade on Kit Harington saying yes to opportunity, and certainly doesn't mean that every inclusive franchise starter must get a sequel no matter the commercial reception. Nor do I argue that every not-a-white-guy franchise is required to only continue via the comparatively underrepresented demographics which featured in the initial breakout hit. But STX's soon scrapped plans to capitalize on bad moms via bad dads is a prime example of this nonetheless ironic train of thought. That Eternals is genuinely inclusive, arguably lousy. Oh, that Eternals is genuinely, genuinely inclusive and arguably lousy is almost progress. I do not think Eternals is at all lousy, and I understand why people are calling it lousy. It's just different, and I consider myself a very astute viewer of movies. I really liked Eternals for what it was, not disliking it. For what it wasn't, if that makes any sense. That Eternals is genuinely inclusive and arguably lousy is almost progress. It counters the unfortunate perception that films created by featuring aimed at not a white guy folks have to artistically succeed at a higher plane of quality. Even if we argue that Eternals can be less than perfect because it's despite being diverse, we can also accept the reasoning for offhand Cop Shop, Birds of Prey, Pacific Rim, Uprising, or anything of this ilk that isn't just Marvel's Black Panther or Disney's Aladdin. Speaking of Aladdin, we'll see if Eternals ends up another example where a success of a female and or minority-led flick leads to a sequel or spin-off for the white guy character. Back in 2012, Universal declared that plans for Kristen Stewart's Snow White and the Huntsman concerned a sequel starring Chris Hemsworth Huntsman exclusively. The $170 million fantasy opened with $56 million that June and earned $155 million to $397 million worldwide. Universal was desperate enough for franchises as Battleship bombed, but before Jurassic World, Fast and the Furious, and Illumination went into hyperdrive, that they preemptively wanted to spawn a franchise. Moreover, they stated intent to build upon what was going to be and turned out to be a female-led blockbuster success by giving the white guy his solo flick. The Huntsman Winter's War bombed with $165 million on a $115 million budget. Hemsworth's third big budget bomb after Black Hat in the Heart of the Sea in just under a year. Remember, it didn't necessarily bomb because Chris Hemsworth is a white dude. You've got to put, I mean, even bankable box office draws and Chris Hemsworth is one charismatic very handsome guy Thor proves he can lead a movie doesn't mean he's going to be able to lead every movie he's also a great secondary character as was evidenced by 2016's all-female-led Ghostbusters reboot anyway Producers promoted Denis Villeneuve's and Taylor Sheridan's Sicario by promising a spin-off sequel starring not Emily Blunt, the film's protagonist, but co-stars Josh Brolin, Josh Brolin and Benicio Del Toro. Even as Sicario was promoted through the lens of how challenging it was to get investors to agree to a grim, dark action thriller with a young actress in the leading role rather than a dude, producers were playing up kicking Blunt out of her own theatrical franchise before part one even opened wide. The terrific Sicario earned $85 million on a $30 million budget. Three years later, we got Sicario, Day of the Soldado, starring Del Toro and uh, Brolin with their villainous ends justify the means drug warriors now retrofitted into sympathetic anti-heroes. The sequel, which played like an arguably dangerous fantasy remake of Clear and Present Danger, where the overzealous war on drugs agents were the heroes, earned a good enough $75 million worldwide on a $35 million budget. Had Snow White and the Huntsman bombed, Twilight's Kristen Stewart may well have received the lion's share of the blame, with the film's failure playing into the still-conventional wisdom that movies for or about women are box office poison compared to their male-led counterparts. 
Heck, the film was a modest hit and Stewart still got blamed for the eventual spinoff with media reports falsely arguing that she had been kicked out due to her caught-on-tape affair with director Rupert Sanders. Had Sicario bombed, Emily Blunt would have taken 95% of the blame compared to her male co-stars. Heck, acting talent and film quality aside, Josh Brolin had a run of being outright box office poison for a decade with the likes of W, Jonah Hex, Wall Street, Money Never Sleeps, Gangster Squad, Old Boy, Labor Day, Sin City, A Dame to Kill for, Inherent Vice, and Only the Brave that would have demolished any not-a-white-guy actor. In both cases, the success of female-led genre flicks, whose respective success was partially rooted in the appeal of a woman starring in the kind of movie usually led by a dude, served only to set up male-led action franchises. When The Huntsman and Day of the Soldado uh, underwhelmed compared to their respective predecessors, the dudes didn't suffer in terms of perceived movie stardom or bankability. These movies happened amid a slew of television-leading ladies, um being written out of their own show. Meanwhile, Gillian Anderson accused Fox of initially trying to pay well below David Duchovny's salary for the 2016 X-Files revival. These concurrent develops argued that women were expendable even when they were co-leads in their successful movies and TV shows. I understand Disney and Marvel leaning on the notion of inclusivity as the main course rather than the seasoning. After all, Eternals is headlined by a slew of not-a-white-guy actors, Gemma Chan is the film's unmitigated protagonist, directed by Oscar-winning Chloe Zhao, and C doesn't feature marquee characters or or much general audience appeal beyond being the latest MCU movie. While I take serious issue with the online discourse arguing that the film's lesser reviews are a reaction to its diverse cast, Black Panther and Shang-Chi have the two highest MCU tomato meter readings with 96% and 94%, while Captain Marvel's 79% ratings isn't a travesty, that's more so the online fandom as opposed to corporate messaging. It'll take a lot, uh, I'll take a lot more of an issue if only the net result of Eternals being a success or not is that one of its only white male supporting characters gets his own franchise. We'll see how this plays out in terms of Eternals' reception, especially after its opening weekend, and who ends up where in the broader MCU continuity. But it's not going to be a good look if the end result of Marvel's Eternals, which was heavily promoted and thus far embraced as a victory for on-screen and off-screen inclusivity, is mostly used as a stepping stone for Kit Harington's Black Knight in his own solo adventure. Alas, it won't be the first time that this situation has played out as much, not even via Disney. After all, Aladdin was embraced as a major on-screen inclusivity win as it legged out to 353 million domestic and 1.53 billion worldwide. Meanwhile, uh, Mina Moussad slated, stated in late 2019 that the film's success had led to not one single new audition, as Disney went and greenlit a Disney Plus movie starring Billy Magnuson's Prince Anders, the film's one character, played by a white guy. Now, this is all very interesting, but when it comes to the MCU, the fact that uh, now, if you've seen Eternals, there are three characters in that movie that have been Avengers. Gemma Chan Cersei has been an Avenger. Uh, Eros, Thanos' brother, a.k.a. Star Fox, has been an Avenger. And, of course, Dane Whitman, the Black Knight, has also been an Avenger. Now, um, these are things that I think they're setting up to add these characters in. Of course, Dane Whitman's character and the Ebony Blade literally figures back into the supernatural elements of the MCU, which they're going to be setting up, which they have been setting up. I mean, we know in the Eternals, the first va- the first serious mention of vampire or vampires has, is mentioned, and it's no it's no um, uh, it's no accident that we hear an off-screen voice at the very end of the movie that's actually Mahershala Ali as Blade because the Ebony Blade that is introduced, uh, if you look it up, look up the Ebony Blade, go to the Marvel Wiki and read read up on the Ebony Blade and see where it goes and how many directions it goes. There's big ramifications for the supernatural elements which are going to be picked up in the Moon Knight television series. I wouldn't be surprised. I don't know for a fact, but I... I wouldn't be surprised if Mahershala Ali is introduced there that we go from the end of Eternals right into Moon Knight and Blade is there, the Ebony Blade is there, it's tied into the symbiotes of the Venom universe, uh, the god of symbiotes, there's ties to even the god Butcher that we're getting in Thor, Love and Thunder. So there's a lot of planning that's going into this stuff 
And uh, I don't think that if Dane Whitman continues on, and he's going to in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, it's a case of white guys. I mean, you still have the comic books that they're drawing from. Um, you know, we got a white girl movie in Scarlett Johansson's Black Widow, which I actually enjoyed very much. Is it a great movie? I didn't think it was a great movie. And uh, I think that they could have done a lot more with it. I thought the first half was really good, though. And I really loved Florence Pugh as, of course, Yelena. Uh, and she was great. So you have another very strong female character in the Marvel Universe. Um, you know, the sooner we get over all this stuff, I think the better off we will be. But, hey, it's going to be with us for quite some time. Anyway, back to the Eternals. Uh, as I said, I really enjoyed it. But there's a lot of other articles that I would love to delve into about the Eternals because I wanted to sort of uh, give you guys all an overview of the Eternals and and just you know put the, uh, you start thinking about the different kinds of things that are all at play here. Now this article is in Variety today. It was written by Rebecca Rubin. It was published this morning at 8:22 in the morning. Eternals didn't dazzle at the box office, but Marvel shouldn't be worried. Disney's superhero adventure. Eternals debuted to 71 million at the domestic box office, a tally that would typically be labeled a disappointment in the blockbuster Marvel Cinematic Universe. First of all, let me point out, no one knows who the fuck the Eternals are. You know, every 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 movie Shang-Chi and Eternals are basically characters that are unknown by general audiences and even their pop culture reach is very very small. Eternals has not been around very long. There's been very few Eternals miniseries. I mean, there was Kirby's initial run. I think it was 19 issues and maybe an annual. Then there was various. There was an 80s version of it. Neil Gaiman did a version of it. There's been various iterations of Eternals. I think all of it's been collected into one omnibus. Uh, I have one omnibus, but the, it's been expanded. And then I have Neil Gaiman's hardcover. So people don't even know the Eternals. So when you go back and you talk about now every Marvel Cinematic Universe is supposed to make a million, uh, a billion dollars, which I get, we're still in a pandemic environment. So, and these are characters essentially. I I would go back and look at the performance of Captain America, Thor, and Iron Man, the first Iron Man, and compare them to those. But you can't even do that because those characters have a wide. They already had a wide cultural pop culture uh, a net that they could cast. Um. But the Eternals doesn't have a fraction of that. All it has is the MCU, and people are not going to go see MCU movies just because they're MCU movies. You might say, well, Rob, people went and saw uh, Captain Marvel, and that, uh, that, wasn't, uh, you know, that wasn't the best movie in the world. Yeah, but you know what? Mothers and Daughters, like I said on, I either said it on Heroes or the John Campion show, people, m Mothers and Daughters had a movie they could go see with the, with the protagonist, uh, that they could identify with in the MCU, and that was an important thing. And while a lot of us might have been or taken umbrage or something, not been happy with with the portrayal, I actually enjoyed Captain Marvel. I saw it three times in the theater. Is it the greatest movie in the world? No, but I liked it. I didn't hate it. I liked it. And was Brie Larson the most charismatic superhero? No, she wasn't. As a matter of fact, I thought she was a little miscast. I think she's a great actress, but you know, you needed somebody... Um, who has more, I think, gravitas, can walk into a room and you take notice. I think she did the best she could. I just think she was ultimately miscast, but she was an Academy Award-winning actress. So, <clears throat> anyway. Marvel movies rarely miss the box office. All 26 movies have opened at number one in North America, and many recent installments, pre-pandemic of course, have ultimately glided to the or glided by the one billion mark globally with ease. Box office observers and comic book superfans have come to expect the franchise entries to generate more than $100 million in their opening weekends. Anything less, by Marvel standards, tends to be classified as a misstep. In that company, Eternals isn't quite stacking up at the box office. The big-budget adaptation, featuring an ensemble cast of Angelina Jolie, Gemma Chan, Salma Hayek, Richard Madden, and Kit Harington, notched one of the worst opening weekends in the MCU, including the pandemic-era releases Black Widow, with $80 million plus $60 million on Disney+, and Shang-Chi and The Legend of the Ten Rings at $75 million. In pandemic times, though, it's a solid start. Eternals landed the fourth-best launch behind Venom, Let There Be Carnage at $90 million, Black Widow and Shang-Chi, so all $71 million may be lackluster compared to other MCU entries, Eternals has sold more tickets in three days than nearly every film released this year made in their entire theatrical runs. Venom, Let There Be Carnage, very successful sequel. Black Widow, obviously part of the MCU. 
Shang-Chi had people like Aquafina in it to bring in audiences. But the Eternals, while a big headlining cast, nobody necessarily knew them at all. Um, it's below Marvel's remarkable average for launching a new series, but we're still in thin air at the top of the theatrical business, says David A. Gross, who runs the movie consulting firm Franchise Entertainment Research. The movie is a creative departure for Marvel. Different is good when it keeps it fresh, but it can also shake the fan base. Since Eternals premiered in the same year as three Marvel-centric television series on Disney+, Plus, well, it's soon to be, uh, it's actually four if you include What If and five if you include Hawkeye, the Falcon and Winter Soldier and Loki, in addition to two other big screen feature films in Shang-Chi and Black Widow, it would be easy to attribute the box office results as a larger sign that audiences are starting to grow tired of all things superhero. There's no denying that comic book fare on the big and small screen alike is more uh, prevalent than ever. In the case of Eternals, however, it doesn't signal that the franchise fatigue has come to plague Marvel once and for all. Eternals had a very unique challenge in that, outside of Angelina Jolie, it didn't have any big-name stars, said Jeff Bach, an analyst with Exhibitor Relations. It's not like Marvel is taking a dip. They ran into a series of heroes that absolutely nobody had heard of. Eternals didn't fall short of Marvel's stratospheric box office expectations because moviegoers are worn down by spandex heroes. Rather, it's because the film didn't resonate with audiences in the same way that prior entries in the popular series have. Reviews for Eternals, directed by Oscar winner Chloe Zhao, have been far less enthusiastic than other MCU titles, and it has the unfortunate distinction as the first Marvel, Marvel movie to get a rotten score on review aggregation site Rotten Tomatoes. Audiences were similarly mixed. It's the only Marvel movie to receive a B cinema score. The first Thor landed a B plus rating, while the remaining 24 movies have fallen into the A range. Given the lukewarm reception, the decline in ticket sales between its first and second weekend in theaters will reflect the degree to which word of mouth can affect Marvel at the box office. Tepid reviews could mean the film drops substantially in its sophomore outing. Shang-Chi didn't have an exponentially better start than Eternals, but the well-reviewed tentpole held steady in its subsequent weeks, propelling box office revenues to $223 million, the most of any movie this year. It remains to be seen how Eternals will stack up against Shang-Chi and Black Widow, but nonetheless, it will easily rank among the top 10 highest-grossing films of 2021. Marvel may not have to wait long for its next box office smash. Box office analysts believe Spider-Man No Way Home, which Marvel Studios co-produced with Sony Pictures, could be the first pandemic release to cross $100 million in its box office debut on December 17th. The third Spider-Man movie to feature Tom Holland as the web-slinging hero looks poised to be a commercial triumph, especially because trailers for the superhero epic have teased the tantalizing, tantalizing promise of a multiverse, an alternate reality that allows multiple generations of Spider-Man actors to appear in the same movies. That means past Spidey's Tobey Maguire and Andrew Garfield, as well as villains like Alfred Molina's Dr. Octopus and Jamie Foxx's Electro may appear alongside Holland. Eternal sets up the future of Marvel in a post-Avengers Endgame world, one in which Tony Stark and Steve Rogers bid farewell to the Earth's Mightiest Heroes. A big challenge in Zhao's film was getting audiences to care about several new characters who weren't as ubiquitous as Spider-Man or Black Panther. That isn't a problem for Marvel's upcoming slate in 2022 and 23, which features characters who have become household names, including Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness, Thor Love and Thunder, Black Panther Wakanda Forever, The Marvels and Ant-Man and the Wasp, Quantum Mania. Even before the pandemic, Shang-Chi and Eternals were considered outside the event Marvel movies we got used to, Sean Robbins, the chief analyst of Box Office Pro, says, in reference to Captain Marvel, Avengers Endgame, and Spider-Man Far From Home, the last three MCU movies to hit theaters prior to COVID-19. Once we get to Doctor Strange, Thor, and Black Panther, those are the heavy hitters. Or, as Bach puts it, Marvel's upcoming slate has characters we all know and love dearly. Those films will be just fine. So... Here's the thing. In my mind, I think it's pretty ballsy that Marvel went and made Eternals because what they're doing is they're trying, they're really pushing the edges of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. They couldn't keep the same things. I mean, you have to assume that the end of the Thanos, the Infinity Saga with Spider-Man Far From Home was the end of those 23 Marvel, Marvel Universe movies. Now we're seeing they're building up something new that has to push the boundaries and they're using this sort of unofficial multiverse series, whether it began with 
I mean, I, I've always maintained that the first time we saw evidence of the multiversal rip in the MCU was at the end of Far From Home with J. Jonah Jameson. Maybe that's just the J. Jonah Jameson of the Marvel Universe, but because it's played by J.K. Simmons, I tend to believe that, no, he's crossed over from a different universe. What's going on? Or, or, or we just were unaware of it. What's going on? Because I don't necessarily think that the spell that Doctor Strange uses in, in No Way Home, I think that already destabilized a multiverse, or the our universe had already been previously destabilized by other forces, and Doctor Strange's spell further, I, I have no knowledge of this, further went to um, destabilize it further. And so we're going to have, uh, there's going to be an unofficial, I don't know if it's going to be trilogy or a quadrilogy, what do you want to call it? We're already seeing the effects rippling through various TV shows and movies. So it's going to be really interesting to see. People are describing Spider-Man No Way Home as endgame level in terms of what's what's happening. So hopefully that's true. Hopefully it'll be cool. I don't have any knowledge of this, so I can't tell you who's actually in the movie. I've heard a lot more people are in the movie than we might even know, but I have no evidence to support that yet. Um so, you know, don't don't take my word for it. Uh, we'll have to wait and see, and we don't have long to wait. Uh, what is it, a little over a month that we're going to be able to see Spider-Man No Way Home, and I'm sure it's going to be great. Uh, can't wait to see it. There's another article I did want to share with all of you. Um, and this comes from uh, Inverse, and I, and I don't know why uh, I... Uh, hang on, let me... Uh, let me call it up. I um, just uh, clicked off of it, and I didn't mean to do that. I don't know why I ended up doing that. So, um, yeah, so I clicked off it, didn't mean to. Let me uh, go here and uh, click on it. So there you go, and I'll bring this article to the middle. Uh, Eternals is Marvel's most beautiful failure yet. Now, this comes from Inverse, who wrote this article. Uh, uh, Jake Kleinman, I can barely read that. Jake Kleinman, and this was published on the 8th. Uh, Eternals is Marvel's most beautiful failure yet. Eternals reveals both the limits and endless possibilities of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. My vessel so lovely, but nothing inside. Now that I've touched you, you seem emptier still. Written by the poet Julio, no, no, no known last name, on the NBC sitcom Friends... Those words were originally deployed as an insult against both Monica and American woman and, and American women in general, but they might as well apply to Eternals and the Marvel Cinematic Universe. The studio's latest outing may be its most visually daring, but it quickly reveals the limits of Marvel's formulaic storytelling. Eternals has been heralded for the use of natural light, meaning director Chloe Zhao used the actual sun instead of artificial lighting for much of the film. The result is many beautiful moments far beyond what Marvel fans are used to seeing from the studio. Some of the most iconic scenes in the MCU are actually pretty ugly if you think about it. Picture the airport fight scene in Captain America Civil War, which is set completely against a gray-black drop, drop with flat lighting. Or the final battle in Avengers Endgame, a wash in shadow and the artificial glow of various superpowers. The conflicts might be memorable, but the visuals are not. The opposite goes for Eternals. This is a movie full of stunning scenery. Our heroes fight on unblemished beaches and rocky canyons. They live in rustic shacks on terrifying cliffs overlooking icy tundras. Even when the movie leans into CGI, it's still gorgeous. Zhao goes so far as to recreate the Hanging Gardens of Babylon. The Eternal spaceship is a monolithic stone slab that looks like something out of 2001 A Space Odyssey. Out of the sunlight, Eternals looks just as good. Zhao uses light better than any director in Marvel Studios history to frame her characters, suggesting complex inner lives that failed to materialize. Over a week of first seeing the movie, I can still remember dozens of shots from its 157-minute runtime, but I can barely remember a single line of dialogue. That's because, to put it bluntly, Eternals is boring. Its characters are all ageless space gods with nothing to lose. When a betrayal among them is revealed, it's supposed to be a big twist, but their actions are given so little motive, it's hard to care. I was just glad the movie could move on from the CGI monsters that dominated its first act, yet another painful Marvel trope. The Eternals themselves might as well be stick figures drawn over a beautiful 3D painting. Zhao is clearly more interested in creating a world than filling it with relatable characters, though the director is hardly to blame. 
Marvel apparently wanted to stack the already bloated cast with even more Eternals before she showed up, but even with that meager win, it's easy to see why she'd focus on the visuals, something she can truly control, rather than the characters who will quickly pass into another director's hands as the MCU continues. If the Eternals do have a place in Marvel's bigger plans beyond this movie, they might not if the current Rotten Tomato trend holds. Whoever writes and directs that movie will have to wholly reinvent the characters. I totally disagree with that. Is Taika Waititi available? Meanwhile, Chloe Zhao's work will live on in the breathtaking images she conjured up for Marvel, even while the studio's own habits held her back from creating something truly incredible. Now, there's a couple of interesting articles about people going after Chloe Zhao and talking about the fact that, well, when women come and direct action movies, things change and people go after them in different ways. I don't think that's necessarily true. I don't think that the criticisms that have been leveled at this movie are wrong. There are a lot of characters here. There isn't a whole lot of motivation. The story should have been far more compelling and emotional than it is. I mean, I would maintain that of all the Marvel Cinematic Universe movies, I'll bet you if there was a four-hour version of this movie, and I'm sure there was, that it would be a lot more interesting than the version we have now. Sometimes when you cut things down, they're less compelling. I would maintain that this could very well be the once upon a time in America of Marvel Cinematic Universe movies. There, I, I would love to see the four-hour cut of this because I think what was lost in this film is a lot of the emotion. I think a lot of, I would, I would guess, and I don't know this to be true, but I think a lot of interaction between the humans and the... I, I was very actually surprised at how little interaction... There is, I mean, you see visual representations of how the Eternals interact with mankind, humanity, but it's, we don't even have, they just kind of look in wonder. We never actually see how do the Eternals relate to humans. The only person who has a relationship is Kingo with his valet. He's the only one. And, and that interaction is priceless, but I would love to have seen how, and I'm sure I can almost guarantee you there were moments of humanity and the Eternals interacting throughout time. But they probably cut that stuff for time, figuring we can just show it visually instead of actually seeing interaction. I think that was a big weakness of the film. I don't, by any stretch of the imagination, think Eternals is a perfect movie. But the things that I was looking for, I mean, I found what was there was already in my wheelhouse enough that I was, I was imbuing the movie with more meaning and more interest than it probably has for somebody outside of somebody who was steeped in all of this lore growing up, whether it was ancient astronauts or just science fiction in general or Jack Kirby at large, you know, there's a lot of, and a lot of people would say, well, Bob, there's not a whole lot of Jack Kirby in this, you know. I'm like, well, I think, though, that there is, though. The, the Celestials and a lot of what was going on definitely felt very Kirby-esque to me. But I think this film, again, it's being pushed and pulled in different directions. I, I would have gone even further with it if I had made the movie. I would have, uh, but but I think for what's there, I, I still found it to be very compelling. Um, there's one last article that I do uh, want to read, and I think um, uh, it's a, it's an, another interesting article and worth definitely worth um, d definitely worth sharing. And let me uh, let me call it up here. It's actually it was in CNN, believe it or not. Um, which I thought was sort of um, sort of interesting. Um, and let's see, put this in there. Uh, okay, and this article, and look, uh, we well, can't really see it. Let me let me. There's actually a Wheel of Time ad, so Stubble McShave would have been happy that the, that's the case. So here's this article, and this is from yesterday. And uh, Monday Morning Rap Party Eternals. This was written by Sandra Gonzalez. It was published at 11.39 a.m. Eastern Time yesterday. Eternals have landed, and we must have a discussion. First and most obvious, a question you've been pondering since you left the theater. How would I rank this among other Marvel movies? Well, friends, I don't like hate mail, so I'm not doing that. But I did place it on this Marvel movie matrix to help you understand our feelings. Eternals is meant to be an introduction to a new phase of the Marvel Cinematic Universe, but unlike some of the other first films we've seen from Marvel, see Iron Man, you would benefit from having some base knowledge before heading into this movie. There's reference to the blip, for example. 
Tonally, Eternals does not have the pure fun factor of a Spider-Man Homecoming or a Guardians of the Galaxy, so I'd measure expectations of that accordingly if anyone who hasn't seen it yet plans to do so. And if you fall into that camp, stop reading after the graphic because spoilers are ahead. A Marvel Movie Matrix, your guide to the MCU. The release of Eternals is kicking off a new phase of Marvel movies, but how does it measure up to the rest? Here's what to expect before you assemble. I actually thought this was pretty cool. Um, <laughs> Mar I, I love this this graph. If you can see on the top, uh, Marvel PhD required. Then to the to the right, seriously funny newbies welcome, and serious. And what's really interesting is <laughs> I like this chart. I think this was pretty good. Then it goes on Marvel PhD required. Now, these are the movies that they say that you have need a Marvel PhD. Captain Marvel, Spider-Man Far From Home, Captain America Civil War, and The Avengers. Well, that's interesting. In the seriously funny camp, you have uh, Thor Ragnarok, Iron Man 3, Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2, Iron Man 2, Thor, Iron Man, Ant-Man, Guardians of the Galaxy 1, and Spider-Man Homecoming. Then you have more Marvel PhD required. Uh, Avengers Endgame, Avengers Infinity War, Black Widow, Doctor Strange, Avengers Age of Ultron, Captain America, The Winter Soldier, and Ant-Man and the Wasp. And then we're down into Sirius, and it's Thor The Dark World, Shang-Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings, Eternals, Black Panther, Captain America, The First Avenger, and The Incredible Hulk. So actually, no, you know what? I think I've been saying this wrong. <laughs> that was newbies welcome. <laughs> but, and this is where we acknowledge that every topic of the Marvel kind is highly subjective. So you're welcome to disagree on any of these placements while you ponder your feelings. Here's some more Eternals buzz. buzz. The MVE, Most Valuable Eternal. Fastos, played by Brian Tyree Henry in Eternals. So many Eternals, so little time. It's hard to say which Eternal really stole the show in the film, but I give my MVE status to two characters, Brian Tyree's Fastos and Don Lee's Gilgamesh. The latter provided the most emotional capital in the movie, playing the psycho-taming yin to Athena's yang. Like her, I have a soft spot for a man with super strength who shatters toxic masculinity with a tender, caring heart and pie-making. Rest in peace. Fastos, meanwhile, was the literal brains of the operation, or as Gary Beekler rightfully pointed out, Dr. Manhattan. If we're talking pure abilities, Fastos was a vital cog in the Eternals machine, in addition to being a pretty wonderful dad, it seems. Bravo to Marvel for breaking down barriers with its first LBG LGBTQ character, and its first deaf superhero in the lovely but underdeserved Makar underserved Makari, but count me on Team Fastos. And uh, there you go. Let's talk money. There are two schools of thought now on the 71 million box office debut from Eternals. School 1. Wow. 71 million. Fourth best debut of the year. Woohoo. School 2. Hmm. Nice, but it's no Shang-Chi. My take? The success of the Eternals can't be summed up in a weekend. Amen. The question that would be making me sweat if I worked at Marvel HQ is if Eternals 2 was a movie right now, who would go see it? Was this the running start to a new phase of the MCU that Marvel needed? If you believe the lukewarm reviews, the answer is probably no. If you believe me, the answer is kinda. Ten new characters was just a lot to serve in one movie, so it was hard for me to get connected. CNN's Brian Lowry offered another thought in the Reliable Sources newsletter. Tea Leaf readers analyzing the slightly below expectations opening weekend of Eternals have cited various factors, but here's another one to consider. With Shang-Chi and now this latest expansion, the studios rolled out two movies based on new characters at a time when Disney Plus has been presenting series based on familiar ones. WandaVision, The Falcon and the Winter Soldier, Loki and the upcoming Hawkeye. The two media can obviously coexist, but people have been getting their Marvel fix of late somewhere other than at the movies. Also, the next wave of Marvel titles are mostly sequels, which should come to battle with more of a built-in following than these films based on comics from the 1970s. Seven not very important burning questions. I'm not going to ask about the meaning of the mid-credit sequence or the end-credit sequence because, frankly, there are Marvel experts discussing that in other corners of the internet. But here are some lesser thoughts plaguing me. Why did the Celestial look like the Iron Giant? Why did anyone else wonder if the use of the song The End of the World played when Fastos is saying goodbye to his family was a reference to another famous Angelina Joe movie, Girl Interrupted? It's the same one used in the scene when Daisy's found hanging. 
Maybe it was the different colored suits, but some of the scenes that featured all the heroes in one shot felt more like Power Rangers than Avengers to me. Agree or disagree? Actually, Logan, my young 19-year-old nephew, said the same thing. How many people in your theater audibly said, aw, when Gilgamesh dropped his pie? Mine had at least four, including myself. Is Angelina Jolie the queen of on-screen crazy? I vote yes. Was anyone else super bummed that Kingo completely missed the big battle at the end? I kept waiting for him to come back and swoop in. Was this a budget or timing-related decision? Either way, if you're in a Marvel movie as an actor, I'd imagine you want to be in the big battle. Justice for Kumail. And Harry Styles appeared to be in the appeared in the mid credit sequence as Thanos' brother Star Fox. Actually, Thanos' 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 brother is Eros. Star Fox was the name he took later. So does this mean that BTS exists in the MCU, but One Direction does not? <laughs> if so, whoa. Yes, it is confirmed that BTS does in fact exist in the Marvel Universe. Uh, Kingo had already secured them to do the song in his Bollywood epic about Icarus. So that was kind of a fun little aside. Now I think, look, I will still stand by my enjoyment of Eternals. I really liked it a lot. I thought it was an interesting way to go with the MCU, the cosmology of it that I'm still reeling from, especially the second time seeing it. I'm like, where is this all going to go? I think, I think, if I were to predict, I think that people, after the initial shock of people not getting exactly what they wanted for Eternals, I think this is going to be one of those movies that people discover over time, where they watch it, people make it seem like it's like a terrible movie. It's not a terrible movie. There's a lot of thought-provoking stuff here. And if you get past the initial shock that it's not exactly what everybody might have wanted or expected, people are going to sit down and watch this movie for what it is, and they're going to see what it is. I see that this movie is going to have, everyone's like, well, Rob, it's boring. I get it. It's not everyone's cup of tea because it's very contemplative. And I think that you really have to start grappling with your own issues in terms of what is this movie saying? What is it saying to you? And there's going to be people that it does speak to and people that it doesn't because it's not a traditional superhero narrative. As a matter of fact, I think that's the weakest part of it all. I would like to have seen the deviants built up and the fact that the deviants are not portrayed as they are in the comics, I think was a mistake. And the fact that we have an evolutionary deviant that becomes an antagonist at the end of the movie, that should have happened at the very beginning. We should have seen that that was already happening. I mean, I, 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 again, I don't, I don't think this is a perfect movie. I think it's an imperfect movie, but I like it and I enjoy it. And I got as much out of it the second time as I did the first, in fact, perhaps even more. Um, but again, I'm watching people, people who see this movie, especially people that are not puzzling over the MCU or not on movie websites watching YouTube content, uh, I think that the general audiences, a lot of them are really enjoying this movie because it is different and it is thought-provoking. And, you know, if you didn't grow up reading about ancient astronauts or things like that, uh, I saw somebody sent me a link to a YouTuber who said the same thing I did about um, this movie is kind of like the flip side of Prometheus, but I said it first. Uh, anyway, no one told me that. I didn't. That was, that was an original Rob thought. That was an original dare I say it, say it with me now, Robservation. So, yeah. Anyway, these are just my thoughts. I'm very curious to see how this develops. I think this is going to be another polarizing film amongst the fan base, but it will be talked about. The fact is, I've talked about this movie and thought about this movie more than I thought about a lot of movies uh, in a long time. And I think that means, hey, there's something to be said for that. Um, I got letters, man. I've got letters from... A people. And um, let me read some. You interested in hearing people's letters? I'm going to start with... um, Who am I going to start with? That's a good character. Uh, That's a good... uh, This is a... a good. Let's start out with Skybeard. Skybeard writes in and says, Eternals was incredible. Not having seen any trailers, I was blown away to see the massive scale of the Celestials, and I couldn't believe I was watching a movie about them. Besides the amazing visuals and massive scale, I was also affected in a personal way. I was moved and often found myself thinking about my family, relationships, and the value of my life and future. I didn't have a problem with the use of the Deviants, as the conflict about that choice had to be made, and it was a main theme. In general, I don't like nonlinear storytelling. However, this was done better than most. Do you think it would have been better to tell this story in a mostly linear format? 
Gemma Chan and Richard Madden had incredible chemistry, and I really appreciated the variety in the relationships that each Eternal had with the others. Side note, I really enjoyed the Loki series on its own, but I really didn't like what it meant for the cinematic universe. <laughs> Example, how do the Celestials fit into the multiple timelines of the Time Variance Authority? That comes from Skybeard. See, I think a lot of people are going to have the same reaction that you did, Sky. People like this movie. There are people that don't like this movie, too. But I think that, the, like you, there are people that are affected by it. Our own Omar94 says, Hi Rob, moderators in the Post Geek Singularity. A story is out saying how the Eternals is not coming out in a few countries like Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, and Qatar due to there being a same-sex couple in the movie. When I read that, I started thinking about it. I know LGBTQ is unacceptable in Islam, but as someone who is Muslim, I will admit to not having a problem with it in real life, and especially in entertainment, because it's fiction, after all, it's not reality. If I watch a movie, a TV show, or anything like that, regardless if it has something LGBTQ about it, I only care whether it was good or not. For example, I like Call Me By Your Name. I didn't care if it had anything LGBTQ in it. I still like the movie after seeing it. It's the same way I would approach someone who is LGBTQ or anybody else in general. I only care if that person is good and decent, who treats me and others well. That would make me like you. If that person was two-faced, hypocritical, mean, or anything like that, it would be the reason for me not liking that person. Because if not being a decent individual, uh, because of not being a decent individual, not because of being LGBTQ. That's just me. Since I was living in one of those countries and had authority over what movies came out, I would have no problem releasing Eternals. Thanks, and live long and prosper. Uh, well, Omar, I, uh, I do appreciate that. And Omar, by the way, goes on. Um, and for years, we've been hearing about superhero movie fatigue. For a while, I didn't have it, but I did feel a sense of being a little burned out. When COVID first hit and everything got delayed, it made me feel a little better because there was an extended period of time between superhero material coming out, whereas before they were all coming out right next to each other. However, with everything beginning to get back on track, my burned out feeling is now returning. Interestingly, Eternals was the MCU movie I've been mo most interested in seeing since it looks to be the most difficult of, or different of the movies done. While I'm still going to see it, my excitement has gone down because of my burned out feeling and also by the mixed response. I think my problem comes not from the movies themselves, but for all the press about superhero movies. We pretty much hear news about them, whether it's a legitimate story or theory, almost every day. So I think that's my cause for feeling burned out on superhero movies. However, nothing lasts forever. So maybe my burned out feelings will go away someday. Just not yet. Those are both from Omar. First of all, I want to get back to you know, LGBTQ content. As I've told you, the first time I had friends that I knowingly knew were gay or LGBTQ, T, LGBTQ plus, I was 13. Uh, it did not bother me in the least. And do you know what the, the, the one thing that was different uh, between my regular friends and my LGBTQ friends? Nothing. Nothing was different. They were all just my friends. I, I would go to a friend's house and I'm like, oh, I'm going to my straight friend Paul's house. Uh, or <laughs> now I'm going to hang out with my gay friend Craig. I never thought that. And no one ever made me think anything different. They were just my friends and we shared... All of my friends were, we were bonded together by our interests in music, movies, the arts, whatever. And the fact that people were gay or straight had no bearing. Now, I know that there's a lot of people, uh, I was already a, a very open minded kid, probably from reading uh, lots of novels I probably shouldn't have been reading, mostly horror themed or science fiction themed that dealt with all kinds of alternative lifestyles. I was reading at an age. Probably I was very too much too young to read them, but and even starting with Star Trek when I was a kid, I was much more open. And human sexuality was an interest of mine, just not as a horny teenager, but just the whole idea of love making and coupling in that way and what it all meant. And I was I was very curious about the fact that here we have these biological and and you know where I got it from, Star Trek, an episode called By Any Other Name, where Kirk is trying to explain to uh, a Kelvin. She's like, I don't get it. You know, you've got these, who's a, an alien in human form. She's like, why is it you're so obsessed with this biologic, this simple biological function? Because if you're on the outside looking in, the simple biological function that is all about procreation is something animals do or whatever. 
but what people don't when you start bringing in your imagination and your creativity and what turns you on, I mean, that whole thing becomes a mental exercise and it's a reflection of your personality and who you are. And being turned on, I know it's an evolutionary trigger to get us ready to go, to bow, chicka, bow, bow, to keep the, to keep the, um, uh, our um, uh, species going. But, you know, if it were just, if it wasn't pleasurable and if we weren't in our own heads half the time, um, that's what I find interesting about it is that sexuality is an expression of personality, creativity, imagination, all of those things. And once you're once you're you're unfettered from the constraints of simply simple procreation, you're using the same mechanics, you're using the same tools, but in a far different way with the added benefit of having all of that creativity, all of that imagination, all of those feelings and wrapped up. It's pretty amazing. And once you start understanding that that I mean, I understand people can't disassociate the two, but to me, human sexuality, aside from using the same equipment, has really nothing to do with procreation. It's a very different kind of a thing that I think is an evolutionary benefit that we all benefit from. But once you start thinking about human sexuality as detached from procreation, which I believe it is, then all the different myriad forms of sexuality become interesting to me. You know, everything, If take your pick you know, whatever fetish you want to talk about, whatever, then it seems silly to me that anybody, uh, any any LGBTQ issues become problematic because I see it as an expression of, well, art and fantasy and personality and uh, imagination, you know, and, and uh, as long as people find others that they can love and that can love them back the way they want to be loved and touched and whatever. It's only beneficial for everybody. And that was something I learned from my LGBTQ friends growing up. They were no different than me. And we had the same fucking arguments about Star Wars and Star Trek and Doctor Who as anyone else. <laughs> so, um, yeah. <laughs> this next one comes from Saburai. Uh Saburai says, what can we learn from Jason Todd, Han Solo, and Luke Skywalker. I don't know. We're going to find out. Hey, Rob, in the Post Geek Singularity, I've been thinking about why replacing characters so seldom works. For example, the generation shift in Star Wars. I enjoyed The Last Jedi, while I hated The Force Awakens with a passion. Me too. I was surprised to learn that most people felt the other way around. I think I've come up with an explanation, and I believe it comes down to respect. To explore this, I'd like to draw your attention to the grandfather of character replacements when Jason Todd replaced Dick Grayson as Batman sidekick Robin. Dick was elevated to become a superhero of his own. His replacement, Jason Todd, looked exactly like him. So did his eventual replacement, Tim Drake. So why did fans hate Jason so much and they eventually killed him off? I believe it comes down to his dynamic with Batman. Dick and Tim respected Batman and they earned Batman's respect in return. This is the same dynamic as when I met a friend of a friend. If my friend vouched for their friend, it's much easier for me to trust them. If the person is antagonistic toward my friends, I become hostile. In the Batman saga, Batman's my friend. I feel I know him. If Dick is good enough for Batman, he's good enough for me. In Grayson's case, he told Batman of and corrected him. It was tolerated because the relationship is so well developed. Jason, on the other hand, was cocky and arrogant. He believed himself better than Batman, and fans hated him for it. So back to Star Wars. For all The Force Awakens gets wrong, it gets Rey and Finn's relationship with Han Solo right. They're excited to meet him, and they respect him. Even though the movie itself pisses on the character of Han Solo, but I won't go into that here. In this example, Solo is our friend, and he accepts Rey and Finn, so we accept Rey and Finn. The same dynamic is not present in The Last Jedi. Luke Skywalker is bitter and resentful, and Rey doesn't like him. If you think about it, Rey is the antagonist and Luke is the protagonist in that movie. She is the one who makes him reconsider that so that he's ultimately giving his life. So everyone who's screaming about storytelling in Star Wars, think of this Luke Skywalker. He gets an arc, but Han Solo does not. Goddamn right on that. I believe that the lack of respect between Rey and our friend Luke is overpowering everything else and makes fans hostile toward Rey. Well, I think... Ray is ridiculously overpowered, and I think she never had to work for anything a day in her life. She just knows how to fly the Millennium Falcon expertly. Don't like that. And wield a lightsaber. Um, 
Just so it's said, though, though I like The Last Jedi as a movie, I actually think Ryan Johnson fucked the Star Wars sequels, but I'll save that for another letter. Anyway, that's my thoughts on Jason Todd, Han Solo, and Luke Skywalker. Thank you, Rob, for reading this, and thank you for all the amazing content you are putting up. Seberai. Uh, well, thank you for that, Sebra. I appreciate that. I don't, I don't, uh, I don't disagree with you. You know, I think that I think we fundamentally now in our society have a lack of respect for our fellow human beings, empathy at all. Um, you know, like I, I, I try and explain to people the whole mission statement of this channel is listen to other people. That's why, I like, like, like I said, I watched Gary Beekler, I watched Nerd Roddick's review of Eternals this morning. And I, while I totally understand where he's coming from, and I don't even disagree with some of the things that he's saying, I was coming at it from a different perspective. Uh, is my perspective more right than Gary's? I don't necessarily think so. It's just that Eternals was appealing to me personally over certain issues that I have quite enjoyed over the years. With Gary, he sees it as another example of, of, of what's been happening in all kinds of entertainment. And I don't disagree with him. There's certainly a lot of that, and he has many salient points to make, and he's not wrong. I just tended to overlook a lot of what he was saying, and I was keying in on the things that I liked. So I think that I got more out of the film than he did. That doesn't mean I'm right and he's wrong, however. And by the way, you know, I don't think Eternals is a perfect movie. I think Eternals is an imperfect movie, and frankly, it's a bit of a mess. And there's things in it that I would definitely have changed if I was making the film. But there are concerns in terms of corporate corporate concerns and studio concerns. I can understand that I think I think Eternals is a compromise. I bet if you could sit Chloe Zhao down and she wasn't being interviewed about it, she would tell you how much she was able to get in the film that made it her own. But I bet she would also tell you that her vision for the movie was compromised by the needs of what Marvel needed and the needs of Disney as well. But that is the bargain you strike when you're a big director or a director, I mean... She was making Eternals before she goes in, uh, before she made no before Nomadland won the Academy Award, and I think what people need to understand about the Marvel Cinematic Universe is it is uh, unlike other, uh, unlike other movies when an auteur really controls the content. When you agree to direct a Marvel movie, you are you are committing to a synergistic relationship with a studio that is already uh, has a majority of the creative already done. Uh, I'm sure a lot of the design work, a lot of the costumes. I mean, I'm I'm also a huge fan. If I might plug the Designing Hollywood podcast, if you watch the latest Designing Hollywood podcast that I conducted um, with Sammy Differ, who she was the costume designer on Eternals. I really love the costume design for Eternals, and if you look at it really close up, the different patterns and the different fabrics they use, I think they're fucking great uniforms. And I hope Hot Toys makes all of them, but they're probably not going to. But anyway, what can you do? Um, the next, uh, letter comes from Michael V. Hello, Rob. I'm writing you today to get your thoughts on something I've been pondering ever since watching No Time to Die. Hmm. I love your passion for James Bond, and I wish I had the same experiences with older Bond films, but unfortunately, I've only ever seen the Brosnan and Craig movies. What? The only thing I can reference in a similar way to Bond is, surprisingly, Godzilla. Both have gone through several iterations spanning decades, and everyone has their favorite version of the character. Godzilla has gone to space, been the villain, been the hero, fought aliens, robots, giant monkeys, and yes, even been killed on a number of occasions. With both franchises coming to a close in their latest chapters in 2021, these franchises have both withstood the test of time, evolving every decade, going through the ups and downs, but both have very passionate fans. Some fans only love the original 1954 Godzilla, and some think the legendary version is the best iteration of the monster we've ever gotten. Some think Shin Godzilla is the best thing since the original. I love Shin Godzilla. And most fans absolutely hate the 1998 Roland Emmerich American version with Matthew Broderick. Now, unlike Bond, I've seen all of the Godzilla movies so far, and I've loved most of them. I find every installment fun and entertaining, despite the numerous plot holes and ridiculous scenarios, even the Roland Emmerich film. I'm sure you would agree that these two franchises are made to be fun and to take you on a journey of a beloved character with every new iteration. Sometimes they're chronological, other times they're considered one-offs. But why don't we accept that in both franchises? People have been turned off by Craig's Bond and how his movies are told, but nobody really complains about it when Legendary did it with the Monsterverse. What do you think about the way we watch these movies going forward and what our expectations should be? 
Would you want to see a continuation of the MonsterVerse told chronologically? Do you feel that Bond should go back to being one-off stories? And do you think, even with as crazy as the MonsterVerse has gotten, Legendary did a better job with Godzilla than they did with Craig's Bond? I loved both movies, and No Time to Die even surpassed Skyfall as my number two Craig Bond, which was surprising. I had to rewatch Skyfall again just to be sure I wasn't forgetting something, and sure enough, Skyfall isn't as good as I remember. Do you think you will look back in a year and remember No Time to Die more fondly than you do today? I apologize if the letter was hard to follow, but I really wanted your more professional take on the two franchises, fans, and expectations as a little case study. I love what you do, and keep up the good work. That comes from Michael V. Well, Michael, you're asking so little of me. (laughs) Where to begin? First of all, this whole idea of, obviously, the MCU has shown people when you have a, a universe, a cinematic universe, just how successful it can be. Now, obviously, with the Infinity Saga, we had 23 movies that averaged out when you average all, when you take all the box office together and divide it by 23, you got over a billion dollars for each movie. That probably, by a wide margin, makes the MCU the most successful film franchise in cinema history. By a wide margin. Yes, way more than Star Wars, way more than Harry Potter. Hugely successful. Why is it successful? Well, I'll tell you why. Because it was planned. It was planned that way from the beginning. And so they have carefully, I mean, and, and by the way, some films are better than others. I mean, I'm a huge fan of Age of Ultron, especially the way it, it, it spun out the Marvel Cinematic Universe. A lot of people didn't like Ultron as much as I did. I thought, look, I thought the first half an hour of Avengers, the first Avengers, was kind of a little weak. But as the movie went along, I thought it was incredible. But it doesn't matter. For the most part, I found all of the MCU pretty wildly entertaining because I enjoy the MCU. It's a new franchise for me. I mean, I grew up reading Marvel comics. I love Marvel comics since I was a little kid. And seeing the way the MCU has been done writ large on the big screen, uh, when you get to those high watermarks, whether it was Winter Soldier or, uh, or Civil War, which I, I think I like a lot, Avengers, uh, all four of the Avengers movies, I think, are marvels of fantasy filmmaking, so to speak. I love, I love both Guardians of the Galaxy films. You know, for the most part, I love uh, I love Captain America, the first Avenger. I love the first Thor. I love the first Iron Man. You go back and you watch the first Iron Man now as a thought experiment. Go back to watch the first Iron Man. Just put it on. It's amazing how wildly entertaining that film is, and it's really the story of one man's awakening. There's no apocalyptic end-of-the-world scenario. It's two guys fighting over the soul of their company and Tony Stark looking for redemption after being a guy that just made a lot of money and didn't think a lot about what his company was doing to the world. And it's a really great character study. And you forget, you go back and you watch Iron Man 1, you're like, wow, this is really good. You can't believe it. And then you you juxtapose that. Go back and watch Iron Man 1 and then watch Infinity War. And you're like, oh my God, wow, what a feat. What a feat the MCU is. So I'm a huge fan of the, the, but now everybody wants that. The problem is you have to plan it. You can't haphazardly go out and make a universe. You know, the Marvel Cinematic Universe was built brick by brick. Iron Man 1, they concentrated on making Iron Man 1 the best it can be. Then I was like, how the fuck are they going to bring Thor into this? But then they did. They hired Kenneth Branagh. They go Shakespearean. They understood what they were doing. And you, because they had to make, if 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 Iron Man, Thor, and Captain America, I know people say, what about the Incredible Hulk? You know, that was over at Universal. I see that as an outlier. It wasn't until they had Mark Ruffalo playing Bruce Banner, I think, that it really worked. It worked within the confines. But if you look at... Iron Man, Thor, and um, Captain America, and see how those things all kind of jibe together, uh, that's how to do it. The problem with James Bond, the Daniel Craig movies, that was all a retcon and retrofit. I, Whenever I watch the Craig Bond movies after Casino Royale, I think to myself, man, if they had known that they were going to make these next four movies all one long story... It could have been great. It should have been designed that way. It could have been broken up that way. Instead, we get stupid shit like, well, there's Quantum, but no, there's really Spectre. You're a kite in the wind, Mr. Bond. There's all this great stuff in those movies. None of it hangs together. And the fact that you, the cuckoo, that all that shit with Blofeld was so stupid. I mean, I, it, was, it was just bad. Didn't like it. It was bad because it was conceived after the fact, and it can never be successful if that's the case. Now, when you come to the MonsterVerse, the Godzilla movies... Um, you know, 
obviously the legendary universe there they the Godzilla the monster verse and by the way when come on man bring in Pacific Rim into that shit but uh bring uh bring that in because I love Pacific Rim so much Pacific Rim Uprising not so much but I think that the monster verse is kind of cool you know the way they've done it because there's been a little it's to me the monster verse is sort of halfway between the, halfway between the MCU and James Bond, it's kind of a middle ground. It's better than what they did with the Craig Bond movies. But I, you know, if you're going to go MonsterVerse wise and bring that mythology up, it's pretty cool. I mean, I thought as much as I liked a lot of King Kong versus Godzilla, it seems silly to say about this. I love the battles, but I thought there was just so much ridiculous in it that I just couldn't. I mean, it's so funny for when I come and say to people, you know, I love Godzilla versus the Astro Monster, where the the aliens of planet, the Japanese aliens from Planet Ten or Planet X, ask to borrow Godzilla and Rodan and then launch an attack against the Earth using all three monsters. I mean, I sit there and talk about how much I love that. I know it's nostalgia when I was a kid, but it's a little difficult when you're talking about the Toho Godzilla series, the three different Godzilla continuities or whatever. You know. There's a little bit of a continuity going on. Then they'll do Godzilla GMK, All Out Monsters Attack, which is a fucking great movie. But it flies in the face of Godzilla continuity. Do I care? No. I don't. <laughs> I don't. You know, I, 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 I watch the James Bond movies as one-offs, even though there's the, the continuities all over the place, which is bizarre that they wanted to have continuity in the, in the Craig films. Like, let's have a close-knit continuity. It's like, why? <laughs> why do that? You know, it's like, but anyway, I, I, I look, I like my James Bond movies as one off adventures with a beginning, a middle, and an end. And my Godzilla movies, if you want to tell a longer story like the legendary movies are doing, that's fine. But you know what? I want to be able to watch a movie like Godzilla All Out Monsters Attack or Shin Godzilla. You know, Shin Godzilla is basically a movie that is about what if there's no Godzilla and Godzilla shows up and basically Shin Godzilla is about FEMA dealing with a natural disaster and that natural disaster is Godzilla. How great is that? I love Shin Godzilla. It's fucking great. Just like Godzilla King of the Monsters is great. And and my favorite uh, Toho movie that's not Godzilla is my favorite kaiju movie, I think, is Rodan. Only because Rodan, I saw it as a kid and it had such an impression on, it left such an impression on me. I fucking love Rodan. I think Rodan was the first color kaiju movie. I loved it because it starts out like a horror film. It's like fucking alien. You know, this miner who's scared out of his wits comes out back from being like, all these miners go into this mine, they all get eaten and nobody knows where they are. And one guy comes out and he's like mortified. He's, he's got the ultimate form of PTSD and through his story you find out what the hell's going on. It's great. Rodan is great. Of course, that was, you know, it was great when I was six. I hope it's still great. <laughs> anyway... Um, look, so what, what, the question you're asking me, it all comes down to planning. Uh, the MCU has a plan. And now I think, I think that what the MCU is doing is they're responding to all these different things. What the MCU needs to do is focus on their plan because I'm sure, and I think, you know, the, the, I, th I Loki, the time variance authority, I think they went too far, to be honest, they went too far. Um, they pushed, I understand they're introducing Kang, you're in Quantum Mania. I think the, the and, and Eternals also went far in a, too far in a different way. So I think that where we're at, people are like, I think the Marvel Cinematic Universe, the biggest problem with it now and why we're seeing a backlash is because they've pushed too far into fantasy land. And it's funny to say about the MCU, well, wow, Asgard, the Guardians of the Galaxy. Yes, but if this makes any sense, all of that was sort of believable within the framework. You kind of got it. You know, we all have, we've all watched the animated shows. Loki and the Time Variance Authority, even though the Time Variance Authority is in the comics, too fucking far. You've gone too far. You've pushed the boundaries of a universe that we believed in. I mean, it was always straining credulity here and there, but it never broke. I think Loki and the Eternals may have broken the, the Marvel Cinematic Universe in ways yet that we can't necessarily, like, I don't know, once once you have all that very, and I think that um, Spider-Man No Way Home is is pushing, it's like, I get it, Into the Spider-Verse really worked really well, but the thing about Spider-Man is he's us. Of all the superheroes, we're the, Spider-Man is the most identifiable to us, and part of that appeal is that he's your friendly neighborhood Spider-Man, but when he's dealing with quantum realities and rips in the fabric of space-time and Doctor Strange and all this, is it too much? Could be. Don't know. Don't know, as the critical drinker would say. Uh, we'll see, though. I'm telling you one thing. Looking forward to it. Looking forward to it 
a lot. Um, so there you go. Let's see. Adrian. Adrian writes in. Adrian says, I'd like to share my review of Eternals. I recognize that you appreciate the artistic side of film, including comic book films. Hence, I think that you would appreciate a view of the uh, uh, Eternals that sees it as a profound work of art rather than just another action blockbuster, which I think most people mistakenly expect it to be and subsequently fail to recognize its high quality. Here's my review. I saw Eternals today at an AMC theater in IMAX, or as I like to say, LIMAX, and I don't think it's a good film. I think that it's a great film. I'm utterly baffled as to why so many critics have negatively reviewed this work of art. It's emotional, philosophical, poetic, action-packed, and beautifully shot. The most critical complaint I've heard about the movie prior to seeing it is that it's poorly paced. According to several reviews that I've watched, the movie supposedly has too much dialogue, particularly expository, and that most of it is supposedly boring and slows the movie down. Now that I've seen the movie, I disagree. The dialogue is interesting and not exclusively or mostly expository. Most of the dialogue is between the Eternals and concerns the following. Keep in mind that the following focuses on the dialogue sequences are also conveyed via amazing flashback sequences that span from 500 BCE to the present day. Their perspectives on the Celestials' means of self-propagation and that of the universe over the long term, example, necessarily sacrificing a planet's life forms to birth a new Celestial so that the Celestials as a whole can continue creating new worlds and new life. As Arishim says, the end of one life begins another. Some of the Eternals accept this process and others reject it. Their relationships, such as Circe and Icarus's romance, Athena and Gilgamesh's romance, Ajax's motherly role told all, toward all the other Eternals, etc. Via these relationships, the audience is intended to see the humanity in the Eternals and empathize with them, and to recognize that this is how they can empathize with humanity and subsequently disagree with the Celestials' means of self-propagation. Number three, their perspectives on human nature and subsequently whether or not humans are worth protecting. Eternals such as Fastos initially conclude that they're not worth protecting due to their propensity for war. However, he changes his mind after forming a family and seeing the potential of humanity in them. Druig also concludes that their potential makes them worthwhile, and he even zealously suppresses their propensity for conflict via his power of mind control. Conversely, Icarus and Kingo conclude that the Celestial's means of self-propagation and the subsequent continuation of life in the long term are more important. Via these focuses of the dialogue sequences, the point of the movie is conveyed. The moral ambiguity of saving humanity versus respecting the process via which life as a whole, life throughout the cosmos and in the future, is maintained. This is what makes the movie a cerebral and philosophical work of art, as well as the amazing cinematography. In addition to the interesting dialogue, there is actually a lot of action which I describe as the following. 1. Intense. The sheer viciousness of the deviants is conveyed at the very beginning of the film in which one man one eats a man whole. In other battles, they mercilessly stab the Eternals with their tendrils and bite into them, all the while monstrously roaring or growling. Countering their viciousness are the powerful eye beams of Icarus, the forceful punches and slaps of Gilgamesh, the lethal stabs and slices of Thena, the impactful energy blasts of Kingo, etc. The result, these two groups clashing, are the most visceral action sequences of the MCU. They're not like the stylish hand-to-hand -hand combat or artificial means of attack, bullets, missiles, and lasers that are in other MCU battles, but are raw and animalistic fights in which sapient beings have, the fight, have to fight uncivilized beasts. Think of the battles involving the Hulk, but even more intense, pure rage versus sapient beings that must put aside all civility. Emotional. In one sequence, the lead deviant kills the motherly Ajak, and in another, it kills the heroic Gilgamesh in front of his love, Thena, as she watches. There's also an emotional moment in the final battle in which the Eternals fight each other. Sprite, in her anger at her permanent existence as a child, has joined Icarus in remaining loyal to the Celestials, and therefore stabs Cersei in her back and through her stomach. Her heartfelt speech about her permanent childhood and subsequent inability to grow up, experience romance and build a family, combined with her violent betrayal of Cersei, is moving. Number three, beautifully captured and rendered. The movie as a whole is breathtaking to look at. It's literally the best-looking MCU movie that I've seen and one of the best-looking movies in general that I've ever seen. 
Chloe Zhao's use of natural scenery and lighting really stands out against the use of green screen sets in other MCU movies. Everything looks so real and tangible and gorgeous. The use of natural scenery and lighting forced the CGI artists to match the realism and natural lighting of the real locations in which the action scenes were shot, resulting in a feeling of groundedness despite the fantastical nature of the battles. Furthermore, everything appears to have been shot with large format, very high resolution cameras. The result conveys an impressive impression of grandiosity despite the small scale of some of the battles. Abundance. A complaint that I heard about the film prior to seeing it was a lack of action. I disagree. The movie has six action sequences, which I think are well-placed throughout it. The opening battle on a beach in 5000 BCE, the battle in London, the flashback battle in Babylon, the battle in the forest where Druig and his followers live, the flashback battle between the mind-malfunctioning Thena and the other Eternals, and the battle between Icarus and the other Eternals. All of these sequences are intense and amazingly shot, and the final one is extremely epic in scale due to involving a rising celestial who's colossal in size. Another aspect of the film that I love is its religious overtones. The film begins with a brief text sequence like Star Wars in which the celestial named Arashem is said to have created the first sun and to have seeded life in the universe. Hence, right away, he is conveyed as effectively being God, though I know that in the comics he and other celestials have gods above them. By the way, that whole opening crawl is a lie, too, in, in this, which I thought was interesting. Hence, as the creation of Arashem sent to Earth to guide the development of humanity for the purpose of catalyzing the birth of a new celestial, the Eternals are like angels. Subsequently, their subservience to him, especially the zealous subservience of Icarus, conveys a sense of religious loyalty to a deity. This is one of several reasons that the film feels profound. Furthermore, because of this, every time that Arashem is shown, he evokes a sense of awe simply by being on the screen. His powerful voice, stoic tone, and earth-dwarfing size, in addition to him being the creator of the first sun and starting life in the universe, all come together to create an impression of majesty that has never been seen in the MCU. He's amazing. I'm very happy that he isn't simply teased in one scene, but is shown four times throughout the film. He speaks at length in two scenes, in one of which he provides a detailed narration of a cool and large-scale visual sequence in which the origins of the Deviants and Eternals are revealed, as well as how Celestials are born. Additionally, the acting is very good. Everyone gives a great performance, especially Gemma Chan as Cersei, Richard Madden as Icarus, and Liam McHugh as Sprite. Also, contrary to what some people have said, the acting is not stilted or depressed. There's plenty of emotional variation in the performances via which levity is provided, and love, anger, inner conflict, and regret are conveyed. Kingo and Gilgamesh provide laughs. Circe and Icarus, Gilgamesh and Thena and Fastos and his partner express love. Fastos also expresses regret, and Icarus expresses anger and inner conflict. That doesn't mean that each character expresses only one of these moods or emotions, because they each express them all. However, there are some moods or emotions that are in the themes of scenes in which particular characters stand out. In conclusion, I love this film. And I will definitely see it in theaters again. I also cannot wait until I can own it on 4K UHD Blu-ray. 10 out of 10 from Adrian. Adrian, you and I, we park our shuttlecrafts in the same shuttle bay. Just want you to know. I feel that way too. Uh, and check this out. I got a letter from Tom Jr. Jackson. Um, our man, Tom Jr. And Tom, it's true. To Live and Die in L.A. is coming out on 4K from Kino Lorber. Hey, Rob, I just came from seeing Eternals, and I thought I would drop some thought on what I thought of the film. First of all, I didn't go, in, I didn't go to a big-budget cinema to see it. I went to a local movie theater that closed like almost 40 years ago. Actually, the last film that was showing there was Break Into Electric Boogaloo. I sat in the back of the theater in balcony seats. Rob, the makeover in this theater is beautiful. It would make you cry with the sheer beauty of it. Plenty of foot room as well. So I went into this beautiful theater and I got comfy and relaxed and began my journey into watching Eternals. Now to be completely honest, I know nothing about them. I went in blind and I had no expectations for this film. I have to say I love this film. I love that it was centered on family, which I've noticed has been a theme with Phase 4. And I love that the idea of family sticks together. I'm glad you said that because that's something that has been seemingly completely overlooked by the critics of Marvel's Phase 4. You're absolutely right. It is all about family, and I think that has been a uh, 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 family and familial bonds are are what Phase Four is all about, which is why Phase Four has to end with the Fantastic Four. But anyway, I, I digress. Um, 
I love this film, and I loved it was centered on family, which I've noticed has been a theme with Phase 4, and I love the idea that family sticks together and has each other's backs, but it was also a love story, a story of right and wrong, and also a story of understanding where oneself is from and is going, and to me, it was a beautiful film. I don't understand why this movie was getting hate from critics. I enjoy these Marvel films and TV shows because they're fun, and that I have to have a good time, and I normally do. What I don't like is when someone decides to review a film and just say it's garbage. I'm sorry, that's just being lazy. I think if you're going to review a film, you should do pros and cons. That is how it used to be when I was younger and people like Siskel and Ebert would review a film. Nowadays, it's all about how negative one can be and how many likes and clicks they can get for being that way. Apparently, trashing movies is the thing and good luck saying you like it because then the question of how can you like this trash garbage gets brought up. Well, here's the simple answer, folks. It's called an opinion. Just like you get to have and others get to have them too. I know that sounds snarky, but it's true. I gave you my pros on why I like the film, and here's my cons, and it is one con. The film was not long enough, in my opinion. I agree. The two hours and 37 minutes flew by, and when it ended, I wanted more. Yep. I wanted to see more of this team and figure out more of the outcome of this thing in the water. But then again, that is me, and I love films that tend to be long. I love the extended editions of The Hobbit and Lord of the Rings, and I personally find them better than theatrical cuts. They are. Now, does every film need these? No. But if they're given them, I will watch them. Now on to the post credit scenes, which I loved and found interesting. Hopefully they'll be expanded on at some point. I want to say that not every film needs a post credit scene, but in the case of Marvel, those do because they're sort of like you're coming into the next issue preview. Now I want to address two things about this film, the same-sex relationship and the one Eternal that was deaf. So let's talk about the same-sex relationship in the film. I saw no problem with it. It was nothing to be shocked over and it wasn't anything to be offended by. I saw two people that care for each other and their kid and that not that how all relationships should be? Yes, it is. There was no agenda or wokeness to it, which, by the way, are two words that annoy the hell out of me, but I digress. The deaf eternal. I love this because I am someone who is hearing impaired. I am deaf in my right ear, which you can find out more about on a future episode of the PGS All-Stars, with which is in the can and waiting to be released. Rob, this is where you say you will release the crack and I mean episodes. Yes, I will. I will. I will, absolutely. I think the fact that they included someone that is actually deaf and shown that they don't let that keep them from being who they are was a huge step in films. They didn't make a big thing about it. They just showed it. Also, I have to admit, she was one of my favorite Eternals. So, all in all, a good time was had. I enjoyed the films, and I guess if I have to end this letter with some advice for those listening, don't watch or read reviews. If you can, uh, if you can, you like, but really make the judgment for yourself. Because I've read many reviews from real people who are not getting anything from seeing this film and saying they like it. So when someone like Rob says that they like this film and give reasons why they like it, but also why they didn't, they mean it. Because a lot of the reviews that come out were pretty much like an echo or a copy of some other one. As I said, just use your own opinion on it. Plain and simple. So thanks for letting me wax on and wax off about Eternals. Why, yes, I did make a movie reference. Until next time, Tom Jr. Daxton, Emeritus, de Goof. Uh, well, there you go. I think, you know what, I'm going to leave that there. I got a few more reviews that I'll read tomorrow. Let's jump in to see what you guys are saying, because a lot of people have been throwing in uh, tips and things, and let's get to those. Of course, Willow, the lovely Willow Yang, is first up. Willow says, if you were an Eternal on Earth, and you didn't have any orders or instructions, would you interfere in various human events? Or would you take a prime directive approach and just allow humanity to develop on its own? Well, you know what? I have to tell you. Um, If I was an Eternal on Earth and I served Arashem and I knew that humanity was going to uh, go the way of the dodo bird once a celestial wanted to emerge from its cocoon, I would probably set myself up as the absolute ruler of the Earth and have a party for uh, 7,000 years. And if there was other Eternals and all that, of course, uh, I I, I would... keep Gemma Chan for myself and I would never have left her. I would have spent all 7,000 years with her, no question in my mind. Or, if I didn't have Gemma Chan and I was just here by myself and I had no orders and instructions and I wasn't beholden to anyone, I would just I'd be like Genghis Khan and see how much of my seed I could spread around. Assuming I could procreate with humanity, which I guess I could if I wanted to because that would be fun. You know, I'd want to have women of every shape, size, color, creed. It'd be great. Um, I'd get rich. I'd make movies. You know, and then when my time was up, why would I care? They, uh, uh, you know, Tiamat would come out of the earth. It'd be fine. Humanity, you know, we'd be this point since we'd just be a few years. And what is it, 2023 in the Marvel Cinematic Universe? Judging from where we're at now, you know, seven thousand years. It's a good run. 
I just get reprogrammed, go to another planet, and start all over again. <laughs> Think about it. Emperor Rob, you know, I don't know what you'd call it, but that's what I would do. Yeah, I'd, I'd make myself absolute ruler of the planet, and uh, I'd party for 7,000 years and help people move along. You know, the first things I'd like to do is, is uh, you know, make sure there's hot and cold running water, get every get everybody very hygienical so we could have like monster orgies and it'd be really enjoyable stuff like that be great uh tom foolery skull duggery sends in a tip and says karoon's the mvp of eternals that would be kingo's valet and the mcu's first vampire hunter that is true too and uh can't wait to see that flashback imagine him with louis from ant-man comedy gold wonder if he could be related to depender from deadpool that's pretty funny also did you see the new no way home imax trailer that dropped today Ooh, i did not if not watch to the end well tomfoolery skullduggery i've been working so i haven't uh so that's interesting um emil johansson hello emil tiamat and Arishem made me hopeful they could do a galactus without making him a cloud oh i guarantee it um, Galactus is coming back, and I'll tell you something. I, you know what? Where did I put it? Where's my, where's my Earth X graphic novel? I don't know. Uh, anyway, I, I busted out my Graffiti Designs Earth X graphic novel because Galactus is coming back, and they're going to tie him in in a big way. To uh, Galactus doesn't eat any planet; he eats planets that have celestials in them, and I think that's going to play, uh, play it up. Uh, Ishmael Montoya. Sends in a super chat and says, hey, Rob, when do you return to the John Campy show? That's a good question. Uh, you know, I, I, uh, he was doing it solo. Then I had a, a week's worth of work. And yesterday my nephew was in town and I uh, had to take care of him today as well. So, um, yeah, so maybe soon. I don't know. I've got, I got, I got a lot of projects cooking. And, you know, John's been talking a lot about getting uh, – he's got all these new sponsors and hiring more people and doing all that kind of thing. Maybe, maybe, uh, maybe uh, he's uh, doing something new. Which is good, because I certainly am. Uh, Jmaster25 sends in a super chat and says, Eternals is about the philosophical clash of utilitarianism versus humanism. Druid and Icarus are two of the most fascinating characters in the MCU because of how far they were willing to go to protect or defy their god. Yes, indeed. And you and I certainly park our shuttlecrafts in the same shuttle bay, and that's why the movie to me was so interesting. Like I said in earlier on in this chat, Icarus... He's a fundamentalist. He believes in his God, whereas, whereas Druig's like, fuck that. These are great people. Why, why, you know, no, no. And I, I think that that's something, that's one of the things that I really, really, really liked about this movie. Uh, our friend, the Jughead from the UK, the Jughead says, hi, Rob. I just saw Eternals last week and I enjoyed it. Like you, I love Jack Kirby and the movie could never match the epic, grandiose majesty of Kirby's work, but it was okay. Uh, I am looking forward to Blade joining the MCU. Me too. I would have loved Wesley Snipes to reprise the role, though. <laughs> yeah, but he's a little old now. Love and respect from the UK, bro. Well, Jughead, thank you for that. I love and respect you right back in the UK. But, you know, I think, I think, actually, you know what? You can't say <laughs> Mahershala, Mahershala, Mahershala Ali is not exactly a young spring chicken. But, me, you know, I like the seasoned daywalker. I think that's a good, it just would have been weird if they bring back, I mean, maybe not post Spider-Man No Way Home. I don't know. I like the, I like, uh, the casting of Mahershala Ali, man. Come on. I mean, we saw him once in the Marvel Cin well, not the Marvel Cinematic Universe, a Marvel Universe, and he was great. He was great. Uh, BK Dan says, what are your thoughts regarding the Campia Spider-Man situation? Also, why haven't you been on the show for two weeks? Well, like I said, I was working one of those weeks. John wanted to do solo for a week, and then the last couple of days I haven't been available. I've just been working uh, on new projects. I haven't had uh, projects. I mean, normally I would take a day off here and there, but... There's been things that I'm I'm having to work on every day. And what are my thoughts on the Campy Spider-Man situation? Um, it's very funny. Because <laughs> I was spending the day with my nephew yesterday. I was taking him around. We saw Eternals, and I took him sightseeing through Hollywood and stuff. Um, and I didn't know what was... <laughs> I didn't know what was going on. People were, like, sending me messages, and my phone was blowing up, and Twitter was blowing up, and all that. Um, uh, I... Uh, if John had asked me about those pictures and I had seen those pictures, I probably would have advised him to not publish them. Um, I, I, I just hold off, you know, uh, 
I don't know. I haven't. Somebody said that he he addresses it on the show today. I haven't seen that. I would imagine he probably should. I I wouldn't have done it. <laughs> I would have told him not to do it because there's those the, the picture the one picture that wasn't of three certain individuals that look alike. That other picture some that was like that looked legit to me. Um, you never know. And in this day and age, when they've been playing so close to the vest with this, I just would have stayed away from that subject matter. And it's not like I mean I understand that. Uh, John probably thought, well, yeah, these are going to get retweeted and shared everywhere. But even the remotest possibility that those pictures were legit, it wouldn't have been something I think would have been. I mean, on one hand, he probably got a lot of subscribers for it and a lot of followers. But I I don't think it was the best thing. I don't know. I, I, I have to talk to him about it. I'm supposed to talk to him later today. I mean, I don't know if he got called by the studios. I don't know. It'll be interesting. I'm very curious to hear what happened. <laughs> Let me put it that way. I don't think he should have done it, though. Uh, ketchup on Eggs said, I love the Eternals, and I love you, Rob. Well, thank you, Ketchup on Eggs. I'm glad we park our shuttlecraft in the same shuttle bay. A lot of people became members. These are all people's re- membership renewals. I want to say thank you to all of our members. We are going to have, I don't think it's, I don't think it can happen this week, but we do have bi-weekly membership Zoom calls on Saturdays where everybody gets together. I get everybody together, and for the members... We have these calls at last hours, and they're fun. They're fun. So um, if you want to become a member of the channel at any level, very much appreciated. But you can join in on the member calls. And I'm going to start doing uh, members-only videos, at least members-only videos for a while. And, um, yeah, so there's going to be a lot more going on with the channel. Sonny Dominguez sends in a tip. Hello, Sonny. How are you, sir? Uh, I posted my Facebook timeline that I was going to see Eternals. I later got a note. It went against community standards saying I was spamming. I have read three others in the post-geek singularity saying the same message with any talk of Eternals removed. Have you heard this? No. Spamming? That's so bizarre. Facebook is so... I have to tell you something. I have been posting on Facebook for like the last two or three weeks and no one... I've gotten no one, not even one like. It's almost like my Facebook account has been completely shadow banned. I don't know if that's true or whatever, but I haven't received any kind of... People have been able to post on my page, but nobody has seen or even responded to anything I've posted in the last two weeks, which has never happened before, which is bizarre. Uh, Sabroso sends in a super chat. Well, thank you, Sabroso. I appreciate that. Uh, Richard sends in a tip and says, I think the vaccine mandate in Scotland will extend to cinemas next Tuesday. I'm now actively planning a train trip to England to see Spider-Man. Our leader's moral superiority to figures in the past is offensive, especially when they are so incompetent. Yeah, I, yeah, I don't. You know what? It's 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 a crazy time out there. I I don't think that they're uh, they're handling everything that well. I mean, now we have a new we have a new mandate here where you have to show vaccination proof and ID. Uh, luckily, I I carried around with on my phone. I am going to get. I have the Moderna vaccine. I'm going to get a booster. Just the, it's a half dose. I'm going to get the Moderna booster just because I'm getting older, you know? And I usually, you know, that's why I drink so much on the weekends because it keeps my body healthy. (laughs) That's what I tell myself. Uh, But anyway, so yeah, um, it's pretty crazy. Uh, But then again, you know, the, the, the cases go up, they go down and uh, it's, it's, I, I just don't see this going away. Not if, if people, and, and here's the thing, let me, let me just say this i mean having worked with a with a doctor i understand and if you look at how this vaccine this is still an experimental vaccine the fda was not going to approve any of it until 2023 of course no other vaccine has been well tested on as many people as the mrna vaccines have been and they they've been looked at for a long time i mean it's not like they just made them up in the last couple of years uh, and they are they are working but but they do have they have side effects i mean mike my doctor friend who i work with his daughter, uh, who's 17, got the vaccination and her heart enlarged, and they don't know what the long-term effects of that are. So there's there's reason for people to not want to get vaccinated. I understand that, and part of that is the the information. I mean, we didn't we didn't get information was here and there and everywhere, and um, it's very difficult. I think there's a lot of people that don't trust the information that we've been given because we have a lot of a lot of uh, conflicting information, but from my perspective, I mean, I've been getting vaccinated for different things my whole life, and they've only made the quality of my life better. 
And uh, so far, I have not had COVID at all. And I realize that this uh, vac- vaccine, such as it might be called, I think that's necessarily, that's another thing that's a misnomer. And perhaps they shouldn't have called it a vaccine. Maybe use a different word, armor. <laughs> you know, it definitely mitigates uh, your risk, but it doesn't stop you, certainly doesn't stop you from getting COVID. Um, so it works differently than your standard vaccine. So people have a lot of a point, but, you know, for the most part, uh, they it's too bad that all of this got so muddled and it continues to be muddled and I, I it bums me out. But anyway, I am, I am vaxxed. I'm going to get my booster. So what that says about me, hey, I feel good about it. But anyway, uh, everyone... I want to thank you for supporting the channel. I'm going to bring an end to this because I'm going to jump on to Justin's channel and talk hot toys and action figures as we do on Tuesday nights. I'm very excited to do that. But I want to thank everybody that continues to support the channel via tips and super chats and letters, of course. If you'd like to send me a letter, you can at the burnetwork.net website. Um, again, if you sign up to become a member of the channel, we have bi-weekly member chats, which are lots of fun. I enjoy them and they usually last for hours and, and all of that. And, uh, I might be doing a midnight or tomorrow. I don't know. Tomorrow, uh, I am on Az's channel for hot toys at noon. And then Thursday at noon, we do, we're doing a, a squid game retrospective review episode by episode. And we are doing episode three of Squid Game. And by the way, as an aside, I don't know if you guys have seen Train to Busan, but the director of Train to Busan has created, uh, it's a new series, a Korean series. It looks fucking bonkers. And it's called Hellbound. Like apparently you get some text message from hell that you're, (laughs) and these unbelievably awesome creatures like come up and if you're sitting in like a Starbucks and it's your time, they will come and pursue you and burn you to a crisp. And I don't know what the hell is going on this show. It looks like there's cults that worship you. I don't know what's going on, but I'll tell you something, man, am I excited for this show? It looks like they made it just for me. (laughs) I mean, all the kinds of things that I like taking theological, theolo, theolo, theo, what theological issues and, and religious iconography and, and that kind of thing, I love when they're brought into the real world. I love that stuff. I love when hell is anthropomorphized. You know, and it's not like an old scratch character, but like they've got, we're, we're in the, we're in a real urban environment where hell just spills over. It looks great. And look up, look up the um, Hellbound, Netflix Hellbound final trailer. Check that shit out. Because man, I want to see it. And on that note, I would say this. Every person you meet has a story to tell that you have yet to hear. And all you have to do is listen. And I last but not least, I want to give a shout out to the moderators. Louise X Sparrow is here. Darren Seeley is here. Uh, Justin Toner is here. Brian Hepburn is here. Man, the blue wrench is out in force because you moderators make this channel what it is. I don't know if Greg Smith is here, but if he is, hey, thank you for that. So thanks to the moderators for being doing the moderating that they do. And on that note, yeah, more Rob, people are like, Rob, Rob, what's with the Rob's observations so sparse lately? No, I'm bringing him back, bringing him back. I'm trying to, you know, juggle the schedule. I like doing Rob's observations. I've missed it. Everybody's missed me. I think I'm going to do a midnighter tomorrow night. Uh, it was fun doing, it's fun having a uh, viewer roulette, and it's fun to do that at night. So anyway, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, have a better day.